Wow, so you, you got promoted this morning then. <laughs> it's news to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here with uh, Tim Kendall, the president of Pinterest. Um, I think everyone pretty much knows what Pinterest is. Um, I, I remember, you know, earlier in my career, it was always like, oh yeah, like Pinterest, like a social network, right? It's a social network like Facebook and Twitter and, um, you know, any of the other ones that were out there. But it seems like that's changed a little bit over time. Um, you know, part of the reason why I would say that is that I probably got the single best push notification I've ever gotten in my life from Pinterest, which was, you know, 10 steak recipes that you would enjoy. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, how, how you think that's changed and uh, where you guys are right now? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure that anything's changed about Pinterest, but I, I do think there's a broader realization in the market that we're not a social network. People don't use Pinterest to find out what their friends are doing. Um, they don't use Pinterest to share what they're doing with their friends. They, they use Pinterest to design their life. So that could mean anything from what am I going to wear today, what am I going to cook for my family for dinner tonight, um, where might I go shopping for shoes on Saturday, where do I want to travel this summer, um, what car do I want to drive in a year, what kind of vacation home do I want to own in 10 years. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's planning and designing your life um, and, and it could be moments that are very small or moments that are very big. Um, and so it's a, it's a tool for people to plan. And that's not a, a social network. What, what I might also add is that the emotional experience of using the product is very different. Um, yeah, you're like planning your hopes and dreams, basically. Yeah, and personally, when, when I use a, a, a social network, my experience when I get off is, is somewhat you know, I would describe it as I feel sort of inadequate. I, I feel like my friends are having more fun than me. They're going to better restaurants than I am. <laughs> um, you know, they're doing just a lot more interesting things with their life. Although you were saying backstage you went to South Africa, so I, I, I don't know about that. That was before I had kids. <laughs> um, but, um, now you guys have an ads business, or you've had an ads business for a little while. Um, how, how do you pitch that, though? Because you look at Facebook and it's huge, right? And they say that, you know, we do a great job of promoting awareness for your brands, right? You go to Google, it's even bigger. They say we're going to catch them, you know, right when they want to buy something. How do, you pitch, how do you pitch to advertisers when you have those two giants sitting right next to you? Yeah. Well, first of all, we talk about what people use Pinterest for, which is they, they use it to discover and do what they love. Um, and so what we tell advertisers and marketers is that what users are there to do is completely aligned with what you're trying to do, which is that you're trying to reach those users. So we talk about the alignment between the needs of the advertiser and the needs of the user and how that, that alignment is perfectly congruent. Um, and, and so, you know, as a result, um, they, get, they get good results. Um, we also talk about the audience. So, uh, you know, most of, I, I think there is a bit of a misperception that uh, Pinterest is niche. But you know, if you look at the audience of, of women 25 to 54, um, there are a little over 50 million of those folks on uh, Facebook. And according to Comscore, there are a little over 40 million on Pinterest. And so when you think like a marketer, you, you, you want to reach the broadest audience possible, but you also want to reach them in a place where they're amenable and open-minded to your product. And we think, and there's a lot of data that demonstrates this, that people are way more open-minded to products and services when they're on Pinterest. So that's a pretty good pitch, right? So you have 175 million users, you, you're able to do that, and you know, whenever I talk to advertisers, you know, they're kind of curious, but you know, the interesting thing about Pinterest is they have this ability to kind of match up images, right? So when you're searching for something, you're searching for an idea, Pinterest can throw something at you that you might not have known that you wanted because it has this, this amount of data on your behavior and knows how to map what this image would be interesting, whether this image would be interesting to you against what you're searching for. Um, and that hasn't been available to advertisers, right? So now it's going to be available to advertisers? You just, you just stole the news. <laughs> yeah, so uh, let, me, let me give kind of the, uh, the prelude. Um, Is the slide actually working? Yeah, All yeah. I see is myself. Oh, okay, okay, there it is. Yeah. So um, about three months ago, we launched an initiative around what we call visual discovery technology. And the whole idea of this technology was that we could use computers essentially to look into images and identify objects and identify characteristics of those objects. So shape, texture, size, sheen. 
And what we're able to do by virtue of identifying all those characteristics is we were able to understand the attributes of objects in the image that people found appealing, even when they weren't able to tell us the words that would describe those objects. Mm -hmm. And so, so like if I search for a chair, you might show me a stool. Correct. And so these were the three technologies or tools that we launched on top of the visual discovery technology. And these were consumer tools, so instant ideas, shop the look, and lens. And the news today is that we are now using... Sorry, I like scooped you on that, by the way. That's all right. <laughs> Sorry, I forgive you. Um, the, news that, the news today is that um, we will now have paid content or advertising in instant ideas and in an area called related pin pins that will be powered by this visual discovery technology. What we've seen so far is it enhances relevancy greatly, uh, which is great for our pinners, right? They see more relevant ads based on these visual signals, and it's also better for partners because they get more value when we show more relevant ads. And I think you can show us a really quick look at it. Yeah, right? yeah so um, let, me, let me talk about sort of a hypothetical example. We plan ultimately to put these ads into Shop the Look and Lens, but we have no plans to announce today. So I want to just talk about a hypothetical example. Um, let's imagine that <laughs> there we go. Let's imagine. Tech that, conference. Um, <laughs> tech conference. That uh, I'm, I'm at a friend's house. And this actually happened to me a, about a month ago. I was at a friend's house. I, I didn't actually know the person very that well. In fact, I hadn't even met the, this guy's wife. But I saw their dining room table. And I was super curious. I, it was a gorgeous table. And I thought, God, I'd like to know where that table is from. Um, and I looked over and I saw this uh, my friend's wife, and I thought, well, the first thing I ask her is not going to be, hey, where'd you get that dining room table? Um, so, luckily, I had Pinterest, and I was able to use Lens to capture an image of that table. Um, once I did that, Lens produced, um, captured the image, and then produced a bunch of visual tags, and then relevant results below it. What would be possible, and, and again, this isn't available today, but we plan in the, um, in the future to have it available, is I could show an ad uh, within these results. I could show an ad from Crate and Barrel. I could show an ad from Dot and Bow. I could show an ad from Target promoting um, a similar dining room table. Mm. And so why, why are you doing this now when this technology has been, you know, you, you launched it earlier this year, right, with Lens and a couple of these others, right? Why, why not launch it right away? So uh, uh, the, the way that these technologies work, and, and this is beyond my depth, so I'm not going to go on too long, <laughs> um, is that they rely on data. They rely on training data. So we need, obviously, the visual data, which comes from um, all these pins. But we also need data around how users interact with these images. And so we wanted to make sure that the technology and the training data was in a place where we could really make big leaps in terms of relevancy. What we've actually seen, you know, we're, we're three months post the consumer launches. We've now identified, uh, and we've sampled this, so it's, it's accurate. We've identified over a billion objects mm -hmm. uh, in pins within, within Pinterest. And how do you think this is going to make advertisers' jobs easier and make them trust you more? Well, I think in the near term, it's just going to allow them to get a higher volume of high quality clicks because that's what happens when we show more relevant ads. Um, I think in the medium to long term, we imagine a world which I think is going to be super compelling for advertisers because what, what we try to do for advertisers, we try to make it easy and we try to make it good, meaning that you get positive results. And one of the things that will be possible with this technology is you could imagine an advertiser saying, I want to sell my product, and all they have to give us is just a photograph an image of that product. They don't have to give us keywords. They don't have to give us any targeting parameters. We can just use the computer vision technology to do the relevancy match and ranking, uh, which I think is, is, a, is, a, is an exciting world to be in, um, where, where putting together an ad campaign with a product, and you know, some, sometimes products have 5,000 different keyword combinations. It's very cumbersome to put together. Um, you can imagine with this technology, um, you wouldn't have to do that. And so you guys are 
when you're pitching this to advertisers, you know, you not only you not only have to sell yourselves against Facebook and Google, you have to sell yourselves against TV. You have to sell yourselves against traditional advertising models, right? When you look at a product like this and you go to an advertiser, how does this alter your pitch? How how do you how do you go to them now and say this is why we're valuable. This is why we're going to be not only competitive with the big guys, your digital ads budget, but you need to allocate like a real, a meaningful part of your total yeah. ads budget with us. I mean, it, this, this particular uh, technology doesn't change our pitch at all. The pitch is the following, which is that we think what we do on Pinterest that's unique uh, relative to all the other applications on your phone is we help generate demand where it didn't exist before. Mm. What you are getting on other services, on search engines, on social networks, is what I would call demand recapture or demand interception. You are grabbing demand that's already been created, possibly by you, advertiser, with dollars in a different place, or possibly just through your brand equity, and you're now paying that social network or that search engine to recapture it for you. And sometimes you're double paying when you do that. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is that if, if, if I do a query for Land of Nod stroller, Land of Nod has already earned the brand affinity mm -hmm. somehow, mm -hmm. either through the reputation of that brand. Because you know it, right? That's or what through, you're yeah, for. or through yeah. a prior ad campaign. Yeah. And so if Land of Nod is paying that search engine again to reach that consumer, I think to some degree there's overlap, there's double paying going on. What we see is an ability to reach somebody before they've chosen a brand or before sometimes they even know what they're looking for. One of the things that's interesting, if you look at our, our search data in text searches, 97% of our searches, we do two billion of them a month, are unbranded. And what that means is that, you go back to that land of not example, most of the time people are searching for stroller, not land of not stroller. It's an incredibly efficient place to reach the consumer because I know they haven't chosen my brand yet, but I also know they haven't chosen one of my competitors' brands. If they're searching for my competitors' brands, how expensive must it be to pull them off of that back to a neutral place and then on to my brand? And what we allow them to do is to reach them, we think, at the most efficient place, which is they're in market, they want a stroller, but they don't know which brand they want to buy it from. So you offer the ability to brands and advertisers to sort of find them and catch them early and then follow them through the life cycle Correct. and hopefully drive them all the way down to them clicking on that and buying that stroller, right? Correct. But when you look at you know, Pinterest and also some of the other newer advertising platforms like Snap and some of the ones that aren't doing you know, quite so well like Twitter, how do, you, how do you kind of break away from being that curiosity or that experiment with a brand that says like, you know, okay, we'll spend 100 million on Facebook sure. and 200 million on Google, and yeah, we'll throw 40 at Pinterest and see what happens, yeah. right? So. I think there's a little bit of a misconception about experimental or curiosity dollars, which is that most of those dollars get spent on awareness solutions that can't be measured. And that's why they're experimental, because they don't actually really know what the outcome is of the campaign, whether it was successful or not. In our case, the vast majority of our campaigns, we can tell the advertiser where they've gotten results. Um, and what we find in, in our world is there is an experimental and non-experimental. There's it works or it doesn't work. And if it works, if we can prove to you, the advertiser, that it works, they spend more and they do it almost immediately. And so. If you look at some of the developments that have happened in the past, you know, one or two years, we've seen some movement where a lot of these brands are kind of going to own the customer relationship directly. You know, you had Luna, Unilever, sorry, Unilever, buying Dollar Shave Club for whatever it was, like a billion dollars. You've had, you can see some gaming companies, for example, going to Twitch broadcasters and basically trying to reach their audience directly, right? For Pinterest, how do you say to them, you know? Yes, that's, a, that's one of your strategies, but we, you still have to advertise with us. We have a critical audience that you can't reach that way. Well, I, I think that you know, there, there's always going to be a market. People are always going to spend time planning their lives. People always have to figure out what they're going to cook for dinner tonight. People always have to figure out what they want to buy at the store or, or what sort of shoes they want this weekend. And, and I guess I believe that as long as we provide the best service for that need, mm -hmm. then we're going to create value for the 
consumer, and by virtue of that, advertisers are going to want to be there. So, so I think it's great that they're creating um, these self-contained experiences like Dollar Shave Club, but they're still going to need to add new customers. Mm -hmm. They're still going to need to resurrect existing customers. And so I, I think the, the need will persist for a long time. As long as the consumer service that is selling this advertiser a solution is creating value for, for the end consumer, and that value is increasing. And so going back to the kind of, yeah, I know you said it's kind of a misconception, but going back to the whole experimental ad budget question, you know, uh, last week Snap reported their earnings, and uh, disaster, right? Like, you know, the stock fell, you know, at least like 20 points or something along those lines. And that had to have altered the way that advertisers are thinking about budgets beyond Facebook and Google. How do you think that affects, how do you think that affects your business? Well, look, we pay attention to it because it's, it's the responsible thing to do. I mean, they're broadly speaking in the same business that we are of providing a service to consumers and making money off of it by, by selling advertising. Um, so we pay attention to it because it's, it's, uh, it's important information for us to have. Um, it has not altered our conversation with, with advertisers. Um, that, that's not to say that there hasn't been a conversation in which this has come up. Mm -hmm. uh, just in my experience, it, it, it hasn't come up. Um, you know, again, I think that if your focus as a in building an advertising technology is make it super easy for the advertiser and make sure it works and it works at scale, and we just we just keep investing in those kind of core tenets, and we we believe that if we do that, sort of this notion of whether we'll get dollars and get dollars fast enough, we'll, that, that will take care of itself. And so when you look at, I mean, when, I guess when we look at the market, um, you know, we like to say like, oh, the IPO window is open, right? Um, you know, we've had a lot of successful entries into it. Snap started off okay. I mean, obviously it didn't go so well after that. Um, you know, Pinterest is spinning up a big advertising business. You know, it's not small when you look at it compared to Snap. It seems like, you know, can be pretty competitive although it's you know, small compared to Facebook and Google, what do you think are the steps that you guys need to do to set yourselves up as a strong advertising pitch in order to potentially go public down the line? Well, we don't, we don't have any plans uh, to go public. Mm -hmm. uh, we've said very publicly, however, that we want this to be an independent company, and we want that uh, we want that to be true for the duration. Well, so, say, 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 you, say you theoretically were going to go public, what would some of the steps be that you would have to take? I don't think they'd be any different than if you weren't going public. I mean, you still have the same job, which is to build a great service for your users, and then ultimately um, you have to make it sustainable by building a business. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I actually don't think it changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately you... you yeah, I think you do the same thing. <laughs> so, when, but when you look at the kind of advertising products you're developing right now, right? Do you find that the conversations with advertisers are getting easier for you? I mean, I'll, maybe I'll answer your last question. Okay. <laughs> like, I, I think for another service where the advertising is interruptive and takes away from the consumer service, like if you actually are mortgaging the future engagement of your user. I can see why you'd want to wait on the advertising front until possibly you were going towards an IPO. In our case, it's completely congruent with the consumer experience. It isn't interruptive, it's actually additive, and so you know, it just makes sense to do it so we can basically fund the business to build more great things for consumers. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, I think in other instances, you might be a little bit more cautious about introducing advertising and ramping it. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're almost out of time, but I, I have to ask because it happened literally like 10 seconds ago. Um, why, why did Biz leave Pinterest? Why did, why did Biz go back to Twitter, which, you know, a very, very pretty chill guy going to a, a pretty unchill place? Like, what, what happened there? Well, we, uh, Biz never worked at Pinterest. He was an advisor. Mm -hmm. So we bought uh, Biz's company, uh, Jelly, mm -hmm. um, and his co-founder, Ben, is a full-time employee. Uh, Biz was always an advisor, mm -hmm. and I believe in this new capacity where he's working at Twitter, he'll continue to be an advisor to us. So kind of business as usual from our side. I will say a lot of the people that I know that work at Pinterest are also pretty chill, but I think we're out of time now. So uh, thank you so much yeah, for joining thank us. Thank you. Yeah.